So, um, thank you, uh, everyone. And um, so, this talk is entitled uh, Improving Scale Recovery to uh, 784 and 799 rounds of Trivium using optimized cube attacks. So, I did it with a uh, And uh, so, first, my outline. So, I will define what, are, what is Trivium, the cube attacks, and then uh, what are the optimization I realized on the, on the attack. So, uh, three on three parts. First, uh, by um, explaining how we can exploit polynomials of degree 2, uh, how we use the Mobius transform to uh, recover many cubes at once, and uh, how we exploit the cycle structure to uh, lower the density. So first, uh, introduction. So this is a trivium, which you may probably know. So it's a stream cipher uh, from the stream competition, and it has three uh, nonlinear feedback shift regist reg register. So in the in the first um, register, we put the 80-bit key. In the second register, we put the uh, initialization vector, which is also 80-bit, in green here. And uh, so we have uh, 1,152 initialization rounds, which just means that we will do four complete turns of the, the cipher. And uh, so this is the feedback function. So there are the relevant points are uh, mainly the feedback uh, T1, T2, and T3. Um, no, sorry, the feedback is here. And uh, so there's only one term of degree 2. Everything else is uh, linear. And uh, the output of the function, it is uh, Z pi here. And so it, it, has, it is the sum of these three terms. So it's a total of six terms uh, linear. So uh, what are the known attacks on Trivium? Well, first, uh, we have uh, the full key recovery on uh, 735 rounds in a feasible time, 2 to the 30. And uh, we can also recover 35 key bits after 767 rounds. So um, it's uh, also in feasible time, 2 to the 36. And then, um, besides key recovery attacks, we have some distinguishers or non randomness properties. And these distinguishers go to, uh, to 806 rounds, for instance. So uh, this is our contribution. First, uh, we have a full key recovery on uh, 784 rounds in uh, 2 to 9, 39 queries. And then we recover 12 key, key bits and uh, some simple quadratic expressions uh, after 799 rounds in uh, the same uh, complexity. So which more or less means that we can cover the full key with some brute force in uh, 2 to 62 queries. So uh, what are the cube attacks? So they've been introduced in 2009 by Diner and Shamir. And uh, we just consider the, pol the polynomial representation of the cipher, depending on the key bits and the IV bits. And uh, there are two phases. So first, in an offline phase, we will extract some low degree expression, which uh, depend on the key bits. And in some online phase, we will evaluate those expressions. And then we just have to solve the system and recover the key bits. So uh, a bit more formally. We have a cube, which is just a subset of the, the IV bits. And uh, we have our polynomial, which depends on the key bits and the IV bits. And uh, so we will just factor the, the term of the cube, VC1 to VCK in the polynomial, such that we have a, a PR, which is the remainder, where no, not a single monomial of PR can be devised by this term. And it turns out that if we, if we sum the evaluation of P on uh, every single assignment of the variables of the cube, uh, we have exactly the evaluation of PC because every monomial of PR will be summed with itself uh, an even number of times and uh, cancel each other. So we can evaluate PC on uh, the input of the power choice. So we assume the attacker uh, has full control over the IV, but not on the key. And uh, it turns out that every time we want an evaluation of this PC, we'll have to uh, make the full sum, which is uh, 2 to the K uh, queries to the polynomial, so it's quite expensive and we don't want to do too many queries. And so we have two things to do. First, we want to check whether the polynomial PC is low degree, and if it is low degree, then we want to interpolate it to use the online phase. Um, so first, uh, how do we test if it is low degree? Well, there's the BLR test, which uh, tests if a polynomial is uh, linear. So it's very simple, we just pick two random inputs, and we check if the polynomial behaves uh, linearly on this input. So that's three queries. 
So uh, yes, three queries. And if you want to do the same thing for a higher degree, so for instance for degree two, when we have a very similar test, which requires you know, seven queries, so it's more than twice as expensive. So let's assume we have recovered when well, we have detected that the polynomial is linear of low degree. Now we want to interpolate it. So the interpolation is uh, very simple. We just uh, set one qubit to one, and we check whether the polynomial changes its value. So, uh, so that's 81 queries for a linear polynomial. But um, the problem arises when uh, we want to interpolate polynomials of higher degree. So uh, this is the, the number of queries which are necessary. So uh, simply because every time we have an evaluation, we receive a binary information, 0 or 1. And uh, since they are, this is the number of monomials of the grid K in a, in a polynomial, and uh, every monomial can be present or not, so it is uh, required that we make at least this many queries. So for instance, for degree 2, this will mean that we need uh, over 3,200 queries, which is way too much to be done in practice. So uh, I tried to sum up three uh, shortcomings of the, the original attack, in my opinion. So first, um, in the original attack, we only consider linear polynomials, um, but it turns out that we can use degree 2 polynomials. They do not cost more, and they are easier to find. And then there's the fact that the, the cube the cube VC1, VCK here, um, how do we choose it? So in the original attack, we just pick a random cube and uh, whether, we check whether PC is high degree or whether it is zero. And if it's zero, we uh, remove an element. If it is high degree, we uh, add an element to the cube. So that's the, the original random walk. But uh, it's not very efficient in practice. It tends to add a lot of elements when we could uh, find the cubes uh, much uh, smaller. So we will suggest a different approach, which tests uh, many parameters at once and proves much more efficient. And finally, the, the cube attack is a very generic attack, so it can, use, it can be used on a lot of ciphers, and it actually doesn't uh, exploit the structure of a, of a trivium, which is very simple, so we can do better than this. So first, um, the first point, how do we deal with the two polynomials? Well, first, I will come back on the BLR test. Um, so it assumes that the input are independently chosen at random, and because of this, we need three queries for every uh, linear test. But actually, we can do better than this. Uh, if we just pick some uh, 10 random inputs, for instance, and we will check uh, linearity on every couple, so x i x j, um, it's a weakened BLR test because we lose the independence of the input. But in practice, it turns out that uh, every linearity test will roughly eliminate half the the nonlinear polynomials. So this is much more efficient because, for instance, with 55 queries, we can uh, have 45 linearity tests. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> the real uh, interesting aspect is that if you want to move to degree two, uh, this is the, uh, the test for degree two. And it turns out that we know every single uh, evaluation from the linearity test. Uh, the only unknown is uh, the first one, P of xi1 plus xi2 plus xi3. So uh, we will have to do an extra query to the, um, to the polynomial. But this is only one query for one degree two test. So uh, to sum up, we will do 100 queries, and this will uh, give us 45 linearity tests and 45 degree two tests. So this is very uh, cheap, actually. And uh, OK, so the, the second part is uh, how do we uh, interpolate uh, the degree two polynomials once we have detected them. So that's the, the tricky part, because we know that it's impossible to interpolate a completely random polynomial in less than 3,200 queries. But so we have to make some assumption to reduce the, <coughs> on, the, on the specific shape of the polynomial. So what kind of assumption can we make? Well, we can look at the structure of a trivium. In the first few rounds of trivium, the first time the feedback function is called on the, on the key bits, and so the first time the grid 2 polynomials will appear. They have this uh, very specific form on the qubits. And uh, since they appear in the first uh, 100 rounds of trivia, they will be everywhere in the, in the cipher. They will be multiplied with other, other registers and such. So it's a fair assumption to, uh, that if we find uh, the grid 2 polynomial, it will have this shape. But of course, we need to verify this assumption. So first, we have uh, done 
some formal interpolation with the 3,200 queries on the queues of size 30, which is still a practi a practical, on a 784 rounds. And it turns out that every single GP2 polynomial actually has its specific shape. So the, the assumption is valid, at least on the 784 rounds. And uh, so the algorithm is very simple. Once we detect the uh, two polynomial, we assume it has its form, and so there are only 80 <coughs> such polynomials which can, uh, which can exist. And we just, in, uh, in 81 queries, because of the, the constant, um, we'll uh, detect which one of those polynomials it is. And then, thanks to the 100 queries we did before, we can check whether the, the assumption actually uh, <coughs> It's compatible with uh, the queries we have done before. So this is uh, very cheap, actually, because 81 queries for degree 2 is uh, as much as the number of queries we need for degree 1. So um, the third point is actually solving the system, because when we have linear polynomials, we just do some uh, Gaussian elimination, and we only need uh, about 80 uh, equations. But with degree 2 polynomials, it can be much harder to solve the system. Uh, it turns out that this is not the case. So uh, why? Because they have this specific shape, and um, during the, off the online attack, sorry, um, since every query to a cube requires a number, an exponential number of uh, queries to the polynomial, to the cipher, it's actually cheaper to uh, brute force some of the qubits. So for instance, if we have cubes of size 35, and we have 32 such cubes, it costs 2 to the 40 queries to the polynomial to evaluate them, and so it's, uh, it's actually cheaper to brute force 40 k bits than it is to uh, compute 32 uh, cubes of size 35. So we will do brute force uh, whatever the, the case, and uh, since we brute force some of those k bits, we can actually choose uh, to brute force the ones which appear here, and every uh, degree 2 polynomial will actually uh, provide us with a linear relation between the k bits. So uh, what to sum up, the degree 2 polynomials are cheap, and they provide us well, they are as cheap as the two polynomial, as the one polynomials to detect, to interpolate, and they give us roughly as much information to answer a certain point. So this is very good. Um, so first, uh, so sorry. Next, um, concerning the random walk, instead we use the Mebus transform, which has been also uh, introduced by well, it has been introduced by Antoine and Ju, but uh, it was used in the case of cube attacks to uh, to compute subcubes in a but not in the regular cube attacks. So first I will define it. If we have a polynomial with an algebraic normal form, uh, we will basically interpolate it by finding out um, the transform of this polynomial, which gives us a zero or one for every monomial, depending on whether or not it is present in the, the algebraic normal form. And uh, it has a time and memory complexity which is exponential in the number of uh, variables. So um, this is not very good, but actually, since computing a cube is also ex exponential, and uh, the algorithm is very simple, computing the Mebus transform will be cheaper than computing a single cube. And uh, the only problem is the memory requirements. So uh, in practice, we use n around 40, so uh, 128 gigabytes of, uh, of memory is required, but that's still doable. So how do you apply this transform to the cube attacks? Well, if we have a cube of uh, k variables of the IV, we consider the restriction of the, the output polynomial to those k variables. We apply the transform to this polynomial. And then, for every subcube of C, we, we check whether the associated mon monomial in Q is present or not. So this is a constant time operation once the transform is computed. And uh, if the, the monomial is present, it means that um, the cube is equal to 1, and if not, the cube is equal to zero. So in constant time, we can compute every subcube of the, the large cube of size k. So what does this mean in practice? If we have k equal 40, and for instance, we are interested in monomials of size roughly 34, well, we can just can compute in a constant time um, 34 out of 40 the binomial coefficients, which is about 3 and uh, 800 well, 3 and, uh, and 3.8 million cubes, and the uh, computation time is only 64 times bigger, so this is really worth it. But we lose the, the random work approach, and instead the only degree of freedom which remains is the, the choice of the initial large cube. 
So how are we going to choose this cube? Uh, well, by exploiting the cipher structure. So first, I would like to talk about uh, the density problem. Um, so we can measure the density of, uh, of the polynomials by using the Möbius transform, once again, since it gives us the, the list of non-zero monomials. And so this, we, this was done after 799 rounds. And uh, we measured the, the number of non-zero monomials for a different monomial size. So first we did on a random cube, so we just picked 40, uh, 40 uh, IV bits at random. And uh, we can observe that up to roughly 35, uh, a monomial size of, th of size 35, uh, the density is about 50%, which means the polynomial is random and dense. And uh, for dense polynomials, there is no hope of extracting uh, linear information, linear sub-polynomials. So uh, that's uh, not very useful. And we have to go uh, much higher, around 37, 38, to have a low enough density to actually uh, extract uh, useful information. But 37 or 38 out of 40 is quite low, so we have few candidates. And uh, this is not very worth it. We didn't find anything using a random cube. So we managed to uh, find an algorithm to, uh, to pick smartly the, the cube. And you can see that the difference is uh, very clear. We have the roughly, we gained about four, uh, four degrees. That is to say, uh, for monomial size 33, density is the same as a uh, size 37 for random cube. So how do we choose this, uh, this cube very smartly? Um, okay, so I just come back on the, um, this is the output of Trivium, this is the, so the sum of six registers, <coughs> and, um, and each of those registers, if you remember the feedback function, okay, that's the feedback function, so this is the output, ZI, which is the sum of those six terms, and each of those terms was uh, generated roughly uh, 100 runs before, because every register has size around uh, 96. And there were, when, when, when they were uh, created, there was only one uh, non-linear uh, monomial. So this is what I... Um, okay, what, what is here? So we have the six monomials, and each of them is the product of two monomials of lower degree. And uh, there are also terms of degree one, but we will actually neglect them because they have a much lower size than the, the terms of degree 2. So to sum up, this is the output of Trivium P. And we can say it's roughly the sum of uh, six products of two uh, polynomials of lower degree. And we will want to find a cube C1 to CK, which will give us a PC of low degree. So um, how do we do this? Well, we make a series of assumptions. Um, first, Okay, we want PC to be of low degree for the cube C1, CK. We will assume that C1, CK will uh, give us low degree polynomials for every product PI1, PI2. So that's not necessarily true, because um, it could happen that uh, the cube gives us a high degree polynomial for, for instance, PI1, PI2, and the exact same uh, high degree monomial for P21, P22, and then they would cancel each other in the sum. But that's unlikely to happen because uh, the polynomials are not generated independently, but uh, from different inputs, and it's unlikely that the monomials are exactly the same. So we will just assume uh, this, uh, this property that VC1 to VCK gives us a low degree polynomial for every product. And furthermore, we assume that for every partition of the cube, in uh, C1 and C2, uh, basically C1 applied to PI1 will give us a low degree polynomial, PC, and the C2 applied to PI2 will also give us a low degree polynomial, so that that product will also be low degree, so degree 1 or 2 or 0. And uh, once again, this is not necessarily, necessarily true. It could be that for some partition we have high degree monomials, and the exact same high degree monomial for another partition, and they would cancel each other. But this is almost necessary, and uh, so we assume that uh, it works. And uh, by doing this, we just pick two, uh, two cubes, well, one partition C1, C2, and check um, whether it gives us the zero polynomial on the, on the 12 involved registers. And hopefully, the union will give us a low degree on P. 
uh, but that's only one partition, and in practice we need more than one. So instead we use uh, two cubes, and we check uh, once again with the Mobius transform uh, to find the cube which will have as many subcubes, which themselves give us the zero polynomial on 12 registers. That's a lot of, of conditions. But the Möbius transform gives us a lot of candidates, so that's worth putting a lot of conditions. And, and then we, we realize the Möbius transform on the, the union. And so the, the result is, uh, well, the, the table which I showed earlier. The density is indeed much lower. And, uh, and that's how we managed to find linear terms after 799 rounds. So uh, to conclude, um, we more or less defined three major issues with the original attack, and we try to address them. So the, the grid two, the random walk, and the, the, the density problem. We managed to recover qubits in practical time up to 799 rounds. And uh, so it's my belief that we could make the full key recovery in uh, practical time, but I don't believe uh, we can go much further because uh, the density increases and the degree also increases, and one trivial because of the dense and the uh, high degree polynomial, there is absolutely no hope of uh, extracting low degree polynomials with this attack. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Do we have questions for tomorrow? <coughs> yeah. uh, thank you for your excellent speech. And here I have a small question about the binary linear test. It seems that you use a small set of the random inputs, right? Yes. And reuse the data in this set and to do the test, right? Yes. So, uh, is there any influence to the success probability? Uh, yes, the, because the, the input is not independent, we yeah. do not have the, the guarantee that um, the success probability is as high. So, for instance, uh, like I said, we will use um, 45 linearity tests but by using only 55 queries. So for instance, if we assume we have a degree six monomial in the, in the black box polynomial, uh, it actually, there's a roughly 40% chance that it will not uh, be detected in the, fa the 55 uh, queries. It will not, uh, not even once it will appear. So if it doesn't appear, we will not detect its presence. But it's not uh, that much of a problem, because for instance, for degree six monomial, it will appear in one key out of 64. So, um, since we have a, a brute force part of 40 bits, we only need uh, to detect 12 cubes for the remaining 40 bits. And even if roughly 40% of those cubes have indeed uh, a degree, um, degree 6 monomial, which will make the attack uh, actually wrong, the polynomial is not low degree, since it will not appear, uh, for most keys we will recover the right key. But uh, for some keys, indeed, um, we will recover a wrong key, so the attack will fail. But in practice, for most keys, it's actually successful. Okay, thank you. So you mean that actually, you, in your experiments, you uh, find some wrong keys? Yes, the, for the some results. keys, the attack will uh, okay. yeah, Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, that's back to my game.